As we prepare ourselves to uh, hear God's word this morning, I'm going to ask you to join me in Jonah chapter 4. Today we will hear our fourth message on Jonah, and the next week we will hear the fifth where we will sort of summarize many of the things that God has revealed to us in this uh, rich book. Listen as I read Jonah chapter 4, then we'll pray and dig into God's word together. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is not this what I said to you when I was yet in my country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? And Jonah went out of the city and sat east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and he made it to come up over Jonah that it might uh, be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, yes. I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle? Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word together this morning to consider it, we ask you, as we always do, that you would be pleased, God, to speak to us, your people. We recognize that you are a sovereign God, and that this is your word, and that you have given it to us for our instruction and for our correction. You've given it uh, at times for good examples, and at other times warnings as bad And we just pray that, Lord, as we consider the things that are in this chapter this morning, that you would be pleased to take this uh, wonderful account that you caused to be recorded for us, and you would bring it to us with a freshness, a vividness, and a sense of um, identification and application. God, grant us to understand um, what you would have us see in this passage. Enable me, God, to speak your word faithfully and clearly. Give your people ears to hear, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we come finally to Jonah chapter 4, the last chapter in this book, we remember all that has happened as God had come and told Jonah to go to Nineveh. And the, such a common story that most of us have known even since our childhood, he refused to go. And he tried to escape another way, and God sent that tremendous storm so that the sailors ended up throwing him over into the sea, and he was swallowed by that great fish. And then the the scripture reminds us that he then uh, preserved Jonah three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, and then delivered him out onto dry ground. Told Jonah once again, go to Nineveh and speak my words to them. This time Jonah went, and as he arrived in that city, he declared to them, 40 more days, and God is going to destroy you. And the scripture accounted for us that on hearing that, the entirety of Nineveh, from the greatest to the least, including the king, said, that's it, we need to fast, 
We need to pray. We need to repent. We need to turn from our evil ways. There was a wholesale, widespread transformation in repentance. A remarkable event that took place that Jonah himself was seeing with his own eyes. Uh, we also w would notice in there, the king had declared everybody was to fast and put on sackcloth and, and show themselves that absolute humility. I deserve nothing. None of the values, none of the comforts, sitting on ashes, none of life. It, is a, it, it was all an expression of absolute humility that I am nothing but dust and dirt. I don't deserve the clothes on my back. I don't deserve the food in my mouth. God, you are just to judge us. But as the king had said, but perhaps God will see and relent of the judgment he was going to bring. And the scripture tells us that God indeed recognized and looked upon their repentance. And it pleased him. And he, he relented. He did not bring upon them the judgment proclaimed. And then that brings us to chapter 4. Now, generally speaking, we would think in chapter 4, when you know, this is part of the challenge. As I try to study the scriptures, you try to identify with the characters and put yourselves in their shoes. And I'm thinking, if I'm Jonah at this time, and, and I have declared the judgment of God to this city, and I've seen widespread repentance break out, and people turning from their sin and crying out to God. In our minds, that's that's point of rejoicing, isn't it? Look at the hand of God. Look at the work of God. Look at the grace of God. I mean, the whole city, everybody is recognizing the reality of my God, Jonah could say. They're not hoping in their gods. They're abandoning their gods. They're abandoning their sin. They're abandoning their ways, and they're turning to God and humbling themselves before him, saying, you are everything, we are nothing, have mercy on us. But shockingly, it would seem, Jonah's response is very different. And I, what I want to note here, if you have your worship sheet, you'll see an outline on the back that we're going to consider. First thing that I want us to see is that there is conceit in the mind of Jonah. Now, we know Jonah never wanted to go there even though God had told him to go there. Uh, God had mercifully delivered him. In his disobedience, what was the punishment, the consequences that came on Jonah? He was thrown over. He was submerged, and we saw in chapter 2, he was convinced he was about to die. And yet God delivered him, and God gave him life. And then in chapter 3, when God said, now arise and go to Nineveh, he did it. But we're, what we're going to see is, though he arose and did it, that's okay, our phones respond to Amber Alerts these days. Uh, as, as he uh, responded, uh, coming out of, really, God has shown him mercy when he has also deserved death. And he comes out and God says, go to Nineveh. What's a little bit disappointing about it is it does not look like he is now going in a loving submission to serve God. But rather it looks like he's going because if I don't go, things are going to go bad for me. If I don't go, I'm probably going to die. And since God gave me mercy this time, it seems like the response is fear. And so when he goes there and he preaches this message, we see this response of conceit. And why I call it conceit is con conceit is defined in this way. An excessively favorable opinion of one's own ability, one's own importance, one's own opinion. And that is the problem that we have here. There are, there are two different minds and two different wills clearly being revealed in this passage. God's mind and God's will. Jonah's mind and Jonah's will. And they're different. What God wants and what Jonah wants are different. And should it not be that the servant of God wants the will of God? That the servant of God, when God is pleased, the servant should be pleased. When God is displeased, the servant should be displeased. Doesn't that make sense? That's not what's going on here, is it? 
here in this passage, God is fulfilling his purposes in bringing Nineveh, that great city, and bringing that whole community to repentance. And when God is fulfilling the desires of his own heart, Jonah looks upon that and says, not what I wanted. What I wanted was their destruction. Why am I having to see what God wanted happen? Why do I have to live in a world where things aren't how I want them all the time? Seems really messed up, doesn't it? I get concerned strongly as I read Jonah chapter 4. I, there's a part of me that wishes there was a chapter 5 and I could hear something about Jonah learned the lesson. And Jonah was changed in his heart and mind. It leaves me wondering what is going on with this man. But you see it because it says this. He was, it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Not, not a small amount. If you look at, if you were to see this language, I put there, adjudged. In the original, it doesn't merely say it displeased him exceedingly. It more literally says it was exceedingly evil to Jonah. Jonah hears that God is going to have mercy. Now, remember, uh, God has 40 days have not yet passed. He's declared it and he's gone out of the city. But uh, the scripture tells us this in, in Amos chapter 3, verse 7 and 8. The Lord God does nothing without revealing his secrets to his servant, the prophets. Okay, so oftentimes, if God was going to bring judgment on a people, he would tell the prophet, go and announce the judgment. If the people repent, he might tell the prophet, I'm going to relent. They have repented. I'm not going to ultimately bring this judgment on them, but I'm going to forgive them. Jonah hears this. He's gone there, said, you're done. You're dead. And then God says, yeah, there, look, look at them repenting. I'm going to forgive them. And Jonah is, he, it says, this was exceedingly evil to Jonah. Basically, he's saying, not right. God, you are doing wrong. What you're doing is wrong in my eyes. <laughs> now, there's a problem with that, isn't there? If God does something that's wrong in man's eyes, who's right? God is always right. The man is in the wrong. And the, and the fact is this. If man does something that is wrong in the eyes of God, who is right? God. The answer to all of this, the one who is always in the right is God. And any time a man's will, a man's opinion, a man's desire differs from God, there's only one that's right, God's, and one that's wrong, man's. Every time. But in his humanity, he looked at that and said, no, in my opinion, these people deserve destruction. Remember, they were hated enemies of Israel, the people of Nineveh. He hated them. He didn't even want to go there in the first place. He does go there, and now these hated enemies are going to not be destroyed, and he's, this is wrong. They deserve destruction. This is absolutely, now, it's not uncommon for people to feel like their bosses have made bad decisions. This is absolutely wrong. This should not be done this way. This is an unfaithful uh, handling of things. Even, believe it or not, at times, Young people can think that maybe their parents have not handled something correctly. Probably never happened in your case. But, and it's just like, no, I know better. Uh, I know why you're doing what you're doing, but my way is better. But somehow, he's not able to recognize that. When our ways and our thoughts are at odds with God, what, are we, what ought we to do? I'm not going to follow my own heart. I'm not going to lean on my own understanding. In all my ways, I'm going to acknowledge him because he always does right. He is always in the right. Remember, we've also looked at many times when, when Nebuchadnezzar came to himself after seven years as a beast. Instead of complaining this was excessive, this was unfair, he says, all of God's ways are right. 
the simple acknowledgement of that. But in this moment of frustration, he overflows. This is not right. He's exceedingly angry, says it's evil. And, and it even goes on to say, and he was angry. Again, part of this is paraphrasing for us. Uh, more literally, and he burned hotly. All right. So he considered God in the wrong because how dare he do different than I want. And because God has decided and determined to do different than I desire, oh, I'm so upset with him. That is a very dangerous and unhealthy place to be. And what's confusing to me at this point is how soon this man has forgotten the kindness and mercies of God. He was himself dying, and then chapter he, he speaks of that wonderful deliverance when he was in the belly of the fish. He has known the mercy of God when he deserved destruction, when he deserved death. He knew God's kindness. He knew God's deliverance. He benefited from those things, and he was okay with that. When he got what he wanted, when he cried out to God, what was his response? I praise you, O oh God. He was full of praise and full of adoration. He loved a God who gave him what he wanted. But then when the same God, the only God, gave him what he didn't want, that's it. I'm done with you. And which, in a sense, is kind of what he begins to say. I'm done with you. I want to die. That's it. I'm done serving. I'm done worshiping. I'm done with everything. Finished. Now, it's uh, shocking to me that, that he would respond this. It is exorbitantly disrespectful that he would respond in that way. Um, it says that it, it, he, uh, it made him exceedingly upset, exceedingly angry. And what's shocking is later, look at, when you look at verse 6, we have the same language when God made the shade plant to grow up over him. It says that he was exceedingly glad. God is doing what he wants, bringing to repentance over 120,000 people to repentance, showing mercy on them and displaying his, his power, his righteousness, as well as his mercy and forgiveness. Remarkable thing. And that displeases Jonah. God causes a little plant to grow that gives him a little bit of comfort and shade from the sun. And that exceedingly pleases him. Now, I would think that, how does a little plant cause exceeding pleasure? And how does uh, the powerful mercies of God displayed cause exceeding frustration? We get the sense here that, that Jonah is clearly a man of extremes. I mean, he, he just lets his heart and his mind run away from him. And we see he's also excessively dramatic, as it says in, in verse 3. He says, um, let's see what it, it says this. For me, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. This is this absolutely caught up in excessive dramatics. And worse than that, he, this conceit overflows to not only a displeasure and a discontent in his heart, but that disrespectful comments. But then look at the criticism that he issues towards God, beginning in verse 2. Now, one of the things that I want us to, you begin to notice in this, the language in, in what he's using there in verse 2, it says this, And he prayed to the Lord and said, Now, I find it funny because what he's doing is complaining and accusing God of, of, of bad things. Generally, this, does, this, this doesn't seem like a prayer. Generally, you think when we're praying to God, we're not telling him how he messed up and how he should have done differently. Praying, we think of as adoring, worshiping, petitioning, requesting, but it's communicating with God. And here he communicates with God his displeasure. Uh, and note in there what he says, O oh Lord, is this not what I said 
when I was yet in my country, and this is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, because I knew that you are a gracious God. I ask you, and, and if you, you probably got it because of the way I read it. Where was Jonah's focus in the midst of this prayer? On himself, right? I said this, I did this. Just generally speaking, where should the, the, the heart of our prayer be focusing? You are glorious. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. That's a different focus, isn't it? One is on the priority of God, the glory of God, the do desire and will of God. Whereas as Jonah comes to God in prayer, it's I wanted, I said, I knew, blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's a sad thing to see. And then when he goes into what, what you would call his tirade of frustration here. It's shocking to me, his tirade of frustration. Because the things that he's saying, that these are things that have made him so upset, are wonderful. I mean, it, it's really... It, I knew as he's overflowing his frustration, I was trying to run away. I didn't want to go there in the first place because I knew you are a gracious God, merciful and slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, relenting of disaster. I mean, wait a second. Uh, why are you stating those things as if they're somehow negative? <laughs> He, he's presenting those as reasons why he doesn't want to go and doesn't want to serve God in the way that God wants. I mean, it's kind of like uh, uh, because simply because he didn't get what he likes in that moment. You know, it, it, it would be something like someone... Imagine in an ancient scenario, a man uh, comes home from work... And he wants a nice steak. But his wife has not prepared for him a steak. She's prepared for him chicken and dumplings. And a bunch of other uh, delicious things. And him saying, ah, oh, I wish I hadn't even come home today. I knew when I came home you were going to put delicious food on the table. And you were going to be looking so beautiful again and being so sweet. The house is going to be all in order. I can't believe this. Like, Wait a second. Is he complimenting or criticizing it's hard to figure out what's going on here because the things that he's saying that have him worked up to a lather of frustration are glorious aren't they what's shocking to me is everything that he is really upset about at this moment has been such a blessing to him but a few days before. Not even, by this point, it's probably less than a month before. Possibly only weeks before. He has benefited from these very same characteristics of God. And yet, he just, I can't believe it. You are gracious merciful and compassionate uh, the phrase slow to anger it's always fun when you see some of these phrases because the the phrase that's often translated slow to anger in our english t bibles is literally now careful for this it, the hebrew is, is this you are long of nostril which i mean if you visualize that i know what you're thinking about a big nose but it, it, it's it's not so it's not so much that but it's uh, generally speaking when people start to get angry and you you've heard that you you know there are visual cues when somebody's getting upset and one of the visual cues that somebody is upset and about to strike is their nostrils flare they just they breathe in because that's it. They're done. They've had enough. They're coming. Well, God is long of nostril. I mean, just slow. It, where, where people might respond rashly, quickly to anger, God is, well, his nose not flaring yet. Wow, his nose is still not flaring yet, even though we've continued to do this. 
Wow, he's still not yet come and got us, even though we've continued to do it. That's why it's translated slow to anger, because it's that idea. He hasn't yet, that's it, because that flared nostril is the last, I'm coming. And abounding in steadfast love, kindness, and relenting of disaster. He was frustrated, and, and the scripture tells us, and, and, I, and I encourage those of you who were here last Sunday to, to look it up and read it, but I'll read it to you. Should not be surprised. Some people will be like, wait a second. He told Jonah to go and say, 40 days and I will destroy you. It sounds like it was an unconditional statement. And then the people repented, and God relented. Or some translations may even say, God changed his mind. But God did not change his mind. Listen as I read for you out of Jeremiah chapter 18. This is what God had delivered, and this was known to those who were his prophets. In verse 7 and following, this is God speaking. If at any time I declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will pluck it up, and break it down and destroy it. And if that nation concerning which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent of the disaster that I, the translation here says, intended to do them, but that's not, that, that word has been added by the translator. Shame on them. I will relent of the disaster I said that I would do to them. So it is within the plan of God that at some of the times and, and other, it goes on to say this, if I ever tell a nation that I'm going to bless them and provide for them and prosper them and they turn away from me and do evil, yeah, I'm going to come and get them. So don't think that there are not consequences for turning away from me. And also don't think that I won't consider mercifully those who, in grace, turn to me. And so, it's known by Jonah that God could and has every sovereign right to relent. He knew he's relenting of disaster because he would know these truths. And this is how it stirred up within him. Now, move on with me to the contemplation. Look at the contemplation. God says to him and asks him this simple question twice. In verse 4, he says this. Do you do well to be angry? Stop for a moment and think about it. Think about who I am. And think about who you are. Think about all that's going on. All the mercies and kindness and benefit that you've received. Think about all of that. Do you do well to be angry that I am all of these wonderful things? And then he says again in verse 9, do you do well to be angry for the plant? Now, just as a simple reminder, this isn't the first time God has asked a question to someone who was in anger. If you were to go back to Genesis chapter 4, he comes and speaks to a young man named Cain. You might know him as Abel's brother. It says this in Genesis 4, verse 4 to 7. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry. And his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? And what's remarkable, it's almost as if his response is, because you didn't accept and you were not pleased with my offering. I gave you what I wanted to give and that wasn't good enough for you, so I must say, why are you angry? And then God explains it to him. Look, if you do well, will not you be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. Its desire is for you, but you must master over it. You need to stop saying, I've done what I've wanted. I've given what I wanted. If God doesn't accept it, what would have been a simple solution that Cain could have done without going into all the theological potential backgrounds in this? God, you have not accepted this offering from my hands. 
What would you have me give you? I will give you whatever you request. Wouldn't that have been reasonable? But instead of submitting himself in service to God, realizing God is God, he gets to accept what he chooses to accept, reject what he chooses to accept. He gets to be and remain God at all times. Cain is thinking, no, I'm upset because he's not doing things my way. He's not accepting what I gave. That all has to turn around, and Jonah is doing the very same thing. And the scary part is this, it, it, that when God speaks to Cain, and even maybe to Jonah, it could come across. When you begin to have this concept in your mind, that my opinion is as significant as God's, my way, my thoughts, my desires are as important as God's. You've completely messed it up. If his ways, which are not our ways, and his thoughts are different than ours, what do we do? God, you are right. Not way, my way, but yours. Maybe we might say, and we have a tremendous example of this in Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, when he is in the plan and purpose of God, going to what? A painful, agonizing crucifixion. And what is his desire in his flesh? This cup pass from me, which means me not have to bear all of this misery and agony. This is why I would like to avoid this. But what is his response at the end of that prayer? You remember it, don't you? Nevertheless... Not my will, but yours be done. So I ask you this. When they came and arrested Jesus, was he exceedingly angry with the Father? When they beat him and mocked him and spat on him and flogged him, was he exceedingly angry with the Father? When they crucified him and hung him on the cross and began to blaspheme him, was he angry with the Father? Was there any point at which... He was angry, displeased with God. No, the scripture even tells us that in, in a real sense, for the joy that is set before him, he endured the suffering, even death on a cross, despising its shame. So for Christ, there is joy in what? Joy in doing what the Father would have me do. Joy in obeying what the Father has set before me. Accepting from his hand that which is his will. Oh, what a difference between Jesus and Jonah. Even if we, uh, as we continue to move on from that, we see this, this contemplation. He's given this, these questions. Do you do well to be angry? And what would have been the right response? God, you're right. I have no place to, to be angry with you. I have been the blessed recipient of your patience and your mercy and loving kindness over and over again. But sadly, that's not Jonah's response. He responds with contempt. The insolence of his response. Look what he says in verse 9. I'm just shocked by this. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. I mean, it's almost as if God says, think about what you are saying. Is this really what you want to say? Is this really what you want to do? Is this really what you want to feel? And what does he say? Yes, absolutely. So much so that I will die. Now, the sad thing also about this is Jonah seems to be checked out because uh, if you die... Do you somehow escape God? If you go up to the highest heaven, he is there. If you go down to Sheol, he is there. God is, is the sovereign over all things at all times. He's just like, I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. But even if somebody is done, and the world does this all the time, I can't bear this, I can't accept this, I can't live like this. But if you go from a life of disobedience faithlessness, and unbelief, and you die, 
because you can't take it anymore. Things go from bad to worse. Now, I will not pass final judgment on Jonah. I certainly have concerns over the state of his life and the state of his soul. Some would say, but he's a prophet. Yeah, God gave prophetic dreams to pagan kings at various times, uh, whose job was to say what he says. I, I like to believe, which means it has no value at all. It's just what I like. Um, that at some point here, when all was said and done, Jonah dropped to his knees. He repented in the same way that they had in Nineveh. That's what I hope and pray happened. But we see there is just an impe impetuous rationale. It is, mm -mm, as far as I'm concerned, if I don't get what I want, if you don't give me what I want, I don't want to live. Give me what I want or get out. Oh, you're talking to God. Because when you, when, you, when you say these kind of things to God, it's not a small thing. Remember, Matthew 10, 28 says this. Do not fear those who can kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy the body and soul in Gehenna, in hell. So, you, you know, you're, you really think that, what are you doing And also, when we see the way that this unfolds and the wonderful narrative of this passage, we see it made very clear who is the commander in this passage. It was, uh, as he comes out of the city, it tells us this in chapter, in verses 5 and 6. It says, and I love the, the regular wording of this, verse 6 says, Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah. So, God, as Jonah goes out of the city, God appoints a plant. That's not something anybody else can do. We can plant a plant, but we can't ordain it. We can't assign it to do something. And more than that, you're not going to get it to grow up overnight so that it can be a shade to somebody. But this is the absolute power of the person of God demonstrating himself. As this man has come out and he appoints this plant, it is going to serve as an object lesson to Jonah. He appoints this plant. The King James there calls it a gourd, which is a kind of plant that bears particular fruits. And this plant grows up. It provides shade for him. But look what also it tells us in verse 7. So God appointed the plant, providing the shade. Then it says God appointed a worm. You know, and that's not a reference to Jonah, which sometimes I look at it and say, God appointing Jonah to go to Nineveh, that's appointing a worm to do a job that should be for a godly man. But Jonah, wind, worms, plants, does God seem to control everything? And I, and I, God appointed a worm, and so this worm goes and eats out the root of the tree so that after one day of wonderful shade, what happens? Now, I, I want to also point this out to you just for a moment. God miraculously caused this plant to spring up in that particular place where Jonah, where Jonah had gone out of the city, miraculously sprung up overnight. Now, in, in my own reasoning, God can also just cause it to disappear, or God can cause it to wither on its own. Does God need to send a worm to spoil it so that it will wither? No. God doesn't need to do anything he does what he wants, and he does it how he wants. And I might think it'd be amazing if suddenly it's there and suddenly it's gone, and I might have plans that I think would be more effective. But God's way is God's way, and God's way is best. And in doing so, it shows us God is, in, is the sovereign over all plant life. God is the sovereign over all insect and animal lives. 
And it goes on to say in verse 8, God, when the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on his head. So in, in this moment, th this God who has controlled the fish, this God who has controlled his prophet and forcibly sent him to Nineveh, this God who has shown his power in turning the hearts of an entire city to himself in repentance is showing himself also powerful in controlling the plants, controlling the worm, where the plant is, how fast it grows, what shade it provides, where this worm is, what this worm destroys, so that it has a particular effect. And that very same day, God sends a scorching east wind. And all of these things, what, what is, what's astounding is all of these things that God is controlling are very personal and very particular to Jonah at this point in his life. The plant provided shade for him. The lack of the plant removed that benefit that he had so enjoyed. And God not only removed that benefit, but he made it worse by sending a scorching east wind. And it was so bad, the scripture says, that Jonah felt faint. And he, that he would be about to die. And, 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 and we see the confusion now uh, come out here in the next part. Here's the confusion. The Lord said, you pity the plant. For which you did not labor. Now it's not that. Uh, now be careful with this. Is it um, that Jonah looks at the plant. And feels so sad for the plant. I wish you hadn't had to go through this oh planty. Uh, you know you look so withered and it breaks my heart. Is that what's going on? Passion and compassion and mercy on the plant. And your children will so no he's not it's not about the plant when he's when he is having a strong emotional reaction that the plant should have been spared is it a com is it a commitment to the plant that he's showing or is it a commitment to himself that he's showing <laughs> he's all about the he he bemoans the loss of the plant because he has lost the benefit of the plant. You know, the, the thing that was, uh, that he, that was moving his reactions was, I lost this plant. And he's got to understand how this unfolds. Because he says, even as you had pity on the plant... Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their left hand from their right, and also much cattle? Now, just in uh, stating this, people get all bothered trying to figure out 120,000. Is that the total number of people living there? And they, just, they don't ever had the law? They don't know right from wrong. They don't know truth from bad because they've never had God's word. And so it's just a bunch of people without uh, a clear understanding. Or is that a reference to small children? And the answer is we don't know. But there were a lot of people who didn't know right from wrong, left from right, who had been caught up and culturally deceived. And, 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 and God looked upon them. But not only upon them, God looked upon, it says cattle, that's really the term for livestock. It includes oxen, it includes sheep, it includes all those things. And, and God says, should I not have mercy on them? Now again, it's not this, it, we, be careful. Because uh, it wasn't so much that uh, the plant, but the plant served Jonah, Right? We've got to start to understand this. The whole purpose of all creation is that it serves God. The, the scriptures tell us this very clearly, and we somehow miss this very often. In Colossians chapter 1, it tells us of, of Christ in verse 15. It says, he's the image of the invisible God, firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, we're not done, 
and for him. So they were not only created through him, but they're created what? For him. Romans chapter 11 also says a very similar thing at, at, the, at the end of that chapter where it reminds us of, of these things. We, uh, verse 34, for who has known the mind of the Lord and who has been his counselor? Well, Jonah wants to be the Lord's counselor. What you're doing is not right. My way is better. Jonah's wrong. No one is fit to be the counselor of the Lord. No one knows his mind. Who has given him a gift that he should be repaid? God does not owe mercy to anyone. When he extends it, we ought be amazed. When he withholds it, we should stand in awe and fear. But listen, verse 36 of Romans 11. For from him and through him and to him are all Things, everything that exists was made by God. Everything that exists, exists for God. And that's something that we've got to understand. This is where the confusion comes in because to him it's inexplicable. I don't understand, God, why you would have compassion on them. I don't understand why you would have mercy on them. I don't get it. Well, the scripture reminds us that there is more joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. The scriptures also remind us, and I think it's important to note, in Matthew 20, in a parable that Jesus was giving where he had called workers in the morning and said, I'm going to pay you a, faith, a, a day's wage, and they agreed for that. Then he went again and he called more workers and said, I'll pay you what's, what's fair. At the end of the day, with only one hour left, he calls more workers. Then when it comes pay time... He pays those workers who had only been there for an hour a full day's wage. He paid the workers who had been there a full day a full day's wage that they agreed to work for. And they accused him of wrongdoing. Had the owner done wrong? No, he paid exactly what he told them he'd pay. And, the, and that whole lesson was given to simply say this, Matthew 20 verse 15. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or do you begrudge my generosity? You don't think these people deserve my mercy. But they're mine. As is everything else. So don't. I get to pick and choose. If I want to, as it says in Romans 9, I will be merciful to whom I will show mercy. I will harden whom I harden. If I choose to show mercy to Nineveh, is that not my right? Yes. If I chose not to show mercy to Sodom and Gomorrah, is that not my right? Yes. If I choose not to show mercy to the whole earth except for Noah and his family, is that not my right? So if I want to forgive some and listen to their cries for repentance, I can do so. And if I choose, listen to what it says in, uh, in, verse, uh, in Jeremiah 13, verse 14 says this, of, uh, of the wicked children of Israel. It says, I will dash them one against another, fathers and sons together, declares the Lord. I will not pity or spare, or have compassion, that I should not destroy them. Whoa. Ezekiel 8, 8 verse 18 says this, Therefore I will act in wrath. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. And it's like, wait a second. So these people... No matter what they cry, you're not going to listen, and you're going to judge them. Yes. Is that right or wrong of him? They have sinned. They are rightly judged. These people have sinned. They would be rightly judged, but God has chosen not to pour out his wrath, but to forgive them. And Jonah says, not fair. They did not get what they deserved. And we just have to sit back and say, you know what? God can pour out his wrath on whoever he 
chooses to because they deserve it. And God can withhold his wrath and grant forgiveness to whomever he chooses because he's God. And so God has the right to have mercy on whom he will, to pour out judgment on who he will. And Jonah simply had to learn this lesson that God is God, so he always gets to be God, and we ought acknowledge him as God because there is no other. And he's always right. And as he is working his purposes, when he brings judgment, we need to acknowledge his holiness and his justice poured out against sin. And multiple occasions in the Old Testament, that's recorded. When he withholds his judgment and wrath and shows mercy, mercy, patience, and grace, what should we do? Worship him in his mercy. So no matter what God does, whether it's the pouring out of his wrath or the withholding of it in an act of mercy and kindness, all our responses to all of God's acts ought to be appreciation, adoration, and submission. We may sit back and say, but I don't understand why he didn't withhold his wrath. That's fine. You don't need have to understand why he didn't because you can't. His, his ways are unsearchable. His judgments are inscrutable. That's how it says at the end of Romans 11 there, which means no matter how much you think about it, you're never going to understand it. So whatever God does, we need to learn to say, God is in control. God is right. God is wise. God is good. God is glorious. And I'm so thankful for his mercy towards me. I know that someday his judgment will be poured out against many, and I deserve that same judgment. And we've got to remember the scripture also says this. In, in, the, in the prayer uh, that Jesus is giving, that uh, Lord's Prayer, it says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. What's sad when I look at Jonah is, here is a man who had received so much mercy, how could he not also show mercy to those? He is one who undeniably rebelled and refused the instruction of God. And yet God did not squash him. These other people deserved to be squashed, but they turned from their sin, cried out to him, and God showed mercy on them too. Should not we who have known the mercy of God long to see the mercy of God given to others? Should not we who have been forgiven much be ready to forgive others? For not we, should not we who God has borne with so patiently be patient with others? How in, how in the kingdom of God we, we get strife and resentments and animosity and all those things. How can that take hold of us when we know the great grace that is ours in Christ? How can we not extend that also to one another? Next week we're going to pull all these pieces from this book together and look at some prevailing themes and some pertinent applications. But um, what a picture today we see in Jonah. Again, how God's ways are not our ways. But God's ways are always right. And the correct response to whatever God does is you are God. You are glorious. You are right. You are good. Praise be to you. Lord, thank you so much that we could spend this time in your word and just digging into it. Um, we are amazed even to see the hardness of heart and the hardness of mind in, in Jonah. Lord, and I guess our tendency would be to uh, think that that's unique to him. But Lord, there are times in our lives when we go through certain circumstances that um, we don't understand why you have allowed those things, why these things are going on, and, and we tend to uh, get angry, express our displeasure. Lord, we pray that we would understand the great deliverance that you have given to us in Christ Jesus. So that if there's anything practical in this world that is denied to us, it matters not because we have the truest treasure, which is your son. We have the sure salvation, which is eternal life. Nothing else can compare. 
Lord, we pray that when we consider this, um, you would teach us to humble ourselves underneath your mighty hand and wait for the due time when you will come and exalt us and give us understanding. But until that time, Lord, unlike Jonah, may you make us faithful, loving, submissive servants who delight in you doing the desires of your heart. In Jesus' name, amen.